Hi everybody, this is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics, and in this video I'm going to talk about how to set up a home theater in a non-ideal room. So the first thing I want to, the reason actually I'm shooting this video here, partly it's the camera was already set up and it's easier, but partly it's because this is an ideal room. So I think what happens is people sometimes see myself, Gene De La Sala, other people that um, you know we do stuff with, uh, do, talk about how to do home theaters and they think well that's great you know but you guys are building custom rooms dedicated to it and they're the perfect shape and the perfect size and everything's good and I don't have that and the, what I try to tell people is almost nobody has that and actually even these perfect rooms are not perfect so I've done million dollar home theaters that are not perfect the room layout is not ideal the dimensions are not what I would want at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're a billionaire or a typical average person, when you design a house, you're not gonna design what we often refer to as warts, like an extra room that's just built onto the house that's perfectly dimensioned as a theater. Um, I get people asking about room ratios a lot. It's really rare that you can actually play with the room ratios. Um, what happens is there's a space in the house that in, in new construction can be dedicated to a media room. So they take that space and they size it out in a way that makes sense. And if we were to play with room ratios, it would mean basically shortening. We can't lengthen. It would be shortening a dimension. And then we have to weigh, is the benefit I'm going to gain from shortening one of these dimensions, often length, going to benefit me in sound more than losses I might have in other things? Like maybe the client wants three rows of seats in some of these crazy giant theaters or more. If I do three rows of seats, can I still do it if I've shortened the room enough to improve the room ratios? So um, in, in reality, what we often are dealing with are just we're stuck with whatever dimensions we have. Up until I first built my own custom dedicated theater like this, which is, I understand, not typical, I just used bedrooms or family rooms or living rooms as my theater space. So I, just like everybody else, just used what I had. That is the norm. That's actually what we typically deal with. So yes, a dedicated space has some acoustic advantages, including that you can treat it the way you need to treat it and nobody cares what it looks like. Um, these dedicated spaces are typically uh, cuboid rooms, meaning that they're basically rectangles, uh, they're boxes, everything can be placed. You've got a place for the side surrounds, the rear surrounds, etc. And that's all great. Most of us, most of the time, are not dealing with a room like that. And so often I get questions like, here's my little nook Here's where I want to put all the equipment. Um, what can I do to make it, you know, really good? Well, the answer is you would be amazed how far off from ideal you could be and still get really good sound. So one thing I hear people obsess over is the angles of the speaker. So they want them located in the right location so that the aperture between them perfectly matches Dolby's spec like to a degree. They have like some version of it, you know, because Dolby gives a range. So they'll say like, well, Dolby says 22 to 30 degrees is ideal between the center and the left. Center, but I, 30 is actually best. So I made them exactly 30 degrees. I'm telling you, you would be very surprised how hard it would be to hear the difference between some of those angles. As you get to the narrower end, sure, you're probably going to start to hear a difference in the sound stage. It's very likely if you added back in wides or something, you wouldn't hear a difference anymore. So... And, and even, you know, even then it may not be an issue. So anyway, for, you know, for a given size room, as long as you can get things kind of close to where they're supposed to be, it's good enough. Um, something that came up recently on a project was a situation where there was a door on the left wall and a door on the right wall. And um, there was no, pl the right place to put the side surrounds um, would have hit a door on one side or the other. So there was no way to make them symmetric to each other. But if you looked at it, they were only off by six inches. So one speaker was six inches farther back than the other. You know, I think most people, even my own reaction to that was like, oh, that's not good. We need to find another solution. You, your hearing off to your sides is terrible. It's a, called a cone of confusion. And the reason it's called that is we actually can't tell specifically to our sides where things are over a huge area because the cues that we use are completely lost there. So like one of them is level distance. Well, directly to your side, 90 degrees out to each side, there's no level distance between the left and the right ear that tells you anything other than how far away it is. It doesn't tell us the distances in this way. And so we, 
have a really hard time hearing it in terms of phase differences. There's no phase shift that happens other than the traveling distance between here and here. Um, so that we can't tell objects that are farther this way or this way. So when they get that far out, we lose our typical cues that we would use. There's no HRTF at that point either that really is coming into play. So when you move a speaker six inches forward from the other one, it doesn't have any effect on your ability to hear what those are for. The other thing that's confusing for a lot of folks is they don't understand what side surrounds are for. They think of it as it's part of like trying to immerse you in these pans around the room and like there's things zipping around like that. That actually isn't really what they're used for. Um, when you're trying to envelop somebody in a space, lateral reflections inside of a room are the primary source of information that your, your brain uses to know that it's in a space. It's what gives us that sense of envelopment and spaciousness. The side surrounds are designed to reproduce that information. The rear surrounds produce a portion of that. They also help to give overhead cues because actually um, producing sound in front and behind you in a particular way with a certain phase shift as it moves makes your brain think that it's traveling overhead. It's not perfect, which is why Atmos added overhead speakers, but it's surprisingly effective. Um, so the side surrounds are not necessarily about things zipping around you. It's really that. Meaning if they're off a little bit, it just doesn't matter. And in terms of the zipping around you thing, it doesn't matter. So what do you do in a non-ideal room? You make the best of it. There is no reason to go and do it. Like, basically, there's no reason to lament the fact that your room isn't perfect because it probably is good enough that you're gonna get a way better sound than you think. There are other issues, you know, like another non-perfect situation that can be problematic is really high RT 60 times with a lot of reflections around the room. And those reflections can make speech hard. My family room is a good example. I should probably uh, clean that area up to, to make it fair to shoot videos and shoot a video down there just to show you guys. But it's so echoey that it definitely is having an effect. The RT60 time is about a second and a half. Now I think, and other people have noted, that the sound is, is surprisingly good given how bad the acoustics are. Um, but, and, and I may try to fix it at some point, it's just that's like a room that's our family space. My wife really doesn't want ugly treatments like this on the wall. So I don't have a good solution there yet um, that, that she's cool with. Um, but anyway, like that's a common thing. So what's the solution there? Better speakers. So if you have speakers with really, really good directivity control and a really good off-axis response, that will do such a good job improving the signal-to-noise ratio of the direct-to-reflected sound. Uh, signal-to-noise ratio in this case is that we're considering high reflected sound essentially noise and high direct sound to be signal. You can improve that ratio with, with more directional speakers now, wide dispersion can still work well as long as the wide dispersion speakers have a really consistent and even response off axis. But when you've got a very high reflected to direct sound ratio and the reflected sound's frequency response is not good, that can end up creating a very garbled experience basically for you and can have an effect. So just better speakers with good high output make a really big difference in bad rooms. So, so I think the answer to this really is don't get too obsessed with the fact that your room isn't perfect. Yes, the more perfect the room, the better the sound, but the differences often aren't as great as people think. And you can get around some of those issues with things like good enough placement, better speakers. Uh, you know, room correction can help to a point. You know, a lot of the room problems can create a lot of resonances and such that can affect sound and just getting those to go away. Um, programs like Dirac and Trinov their processing has the ability to improve the impulse response, which does reduce some of the decay out farther and cleans that up. That makes a difference. It's not a replacement for acoustic treatments, but it, it can help where you don't have the ability to do acoustic treatments. And then beyond that, um, finding ways to put acoustic treatments in. So another really common one, I've brought this up before, you've got a wall on one side, you've got nothing on the other. What do you do? Well, you can't put a wall up. You can't even put a false wall up. So you could put acoustic treatments on the other wall. Maybe that wall is actually not a wall, really. I mean, it is, but maybe it's like all glass, right? Well, you might be able to put absorptive curtains or roller shades. There are absor absorptive roller shades now um, that you, you put that up there and it would absorb sound to make it a little bit more like the other side. Having some asymmetry between the two sides is not the end of the world. So, you know, that's another option. And, you know, 
I, I will say I've never had somebody come to me. I have people come to me all the time saying this is probably the worst room you've ever seen. I've never had anyone come to me with a room where I'm like, you just, you just need a different space. The, in fact, the only time that ends up being true is when somebody's trying to put too much stuff in the room. So if somebody comes to you and they're like, I want a 150 inch uh, screen. I want uh, nine bed layer channels. I want six overhead channels. I want infrasonic subwoofers. I want uh, you know, regular subwoofers. Um, I want everything all around the room. I want acoustic treatments. I want diffusion. I want everything perfect. And it's like, it's going into a 10 by 12 bedroom. And you just, you just can't get there from here. Like you can't fit that much stuff in there. But the 10 by 12 bedroom could still make a really good theater. It's just going to have to be a much smaller and simpler one. So that's my take on what to do when you have non-ideal spaces. It, it's, I think, as simple as you make the best of it, and it's probably better than you think it's going to be. I hope this was helpful. Subscribe, and you can keep getting more of this. So thanks again.